Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Milano, and I'm the head of the Medical Center Archives at New York Presbyterian Wild Cordell Medicine. I want to thank you all for joining us today for the Heberden Society, a history of medicine lecture series held at Wild Cordell Medicine since 1975. Now, before we hear from our wonderful speaker, Dr. Deirdre Cooper Owens, I do have a few announcements to make. If you enjoy tonight's talk, I'd invite you to join us for next year's Hebert and Society Lectures. We will be posting the schedule at the beginning of the next academic year, which we will also share on our website and via the Hebert and Society listserv. A huge thank you goes to Dr. David Wolf, Wolf, who has generously sponsored this year's lectures. Now, if you're interested in the history of the New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell Medical Center, I would invite you to explore the website for our very own Medical Center archives. The Medical Center archives collects, preserves, and creates accessibility to the history of the Medical Center dating all the way back to 1771. Now we are an archive and not a museum, meaning we collect and preserve mostly 2D documents and photographs, but we do have a few 3D artifacts such as the one seen here. These are the instruments in case used by Dr. Thomas Marco, who was a consulting surgeon to the Lying In Hospital from 1890 to 1901. The instruments, of course, reminded me of the cover of Dr. Cooper Owens's book, which includes obstetrical forceps. Now, the Lying In Hospital was created in the 18th century by the personal physician to Alexander Hamilton, and many years in different forms later is now the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at our medical center. The Medical Center Archives website contains thousands of digitized historical photographs and documents, including many related to the Lying In Hospital, available through the link seen here. Now, we do invite you to participate in our Q&A session today. You'll find a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen where you can enter a question, and we'll get to as many as possible as we can after Dr. Cooper Owens' lecture. So I'm now going to turn the virtual microphone over to Dr. Laura Riley, Chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Weill Cornell Medicine and Obstetrician and Gynecologist-in-Chief at the New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center, and she will be introducing our speaker. Thank you, Nicole. So I have the great uh, honor and privilege of introducing Dr. Deirdre Cooper Owens, who is an award-winning historian and is the Charles and Linda Wilson Professor in the History of Medicine and Director of the Humanities and Medicine Program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. In this position, Dr. Cooper Owens is the only Black woman in the United States running a traditional medical humanities program. Dr. Cooper Owens is also the Director of the Program in African American History at the Library Company of Philadelphia, the country's oldest cultural institution. As a teacher and public speaker, Dr. Cooper Owens knows that staying immersed in the worlds that cultivated her growing interest in history is what keeps her grounded and committed to teaching community-based history. Her description of her grandfather and the stories he told bring back memories that I have of my West Indian grandmother. The truths that they imparted to us as children are permanently etched in our minds as well as our hearts. Dr. Cooper Owens is a proud graduate of two historically black colleges and universities, the All Women's Bennett College and Clark Atlanta University. She earned her PhD in history at UCLA and has had several prestigious fellowships at the University of Virginia, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and as a Big Ten Academic Leadership Fellow. As one of the country's most acclaimed experts in US history, according to Time Magazine, Dr. Cooper Owens is steadily working towards making history more accessible and inspiring for us all. Dr. Cooper Owens has published multiple articles essays, book chapters, and perspectives on several issues that concern American, African-American experiences and reproductive justice. Many of you in this community may have read her book entitled Medical Bondage, Race, Gender, and the Origins of American Gynecology, which was the subject of a robust discussion at book club earlier this week. While jarring, it is important to understand the basis for some of what we see today in persistent and pervasive health inequities. 
Her book, published in 2017, won the 2018 Darlene Clark Hine Book Award from the Organization of American Historians as the best book written in African American women's and gender history. Without further ado, Dr. Cooper Owens, welcome to New York Presbyterian Hospital while Cornell Medicine. Thank you so, so very much. Um, let me get the formalities out of the way. I'm such an informal person, but I need to get the formalities out of the way. So thank you, Wild Cornell Medicine, the Heberden Society for having me. I remember meeting Nicole Milano at one of the big history of medicine conferences. And I think I was still living in New York at the time and she invited me. Um, my life has changed since then. Um, so I thank you for extending the, invita the invitation to share my work uh, with your colleagues. Dr. Riley, thank you for making me sound so good. I, <laughs> I am just bowled over by that, that introduction, thank you. And also Dr. David Wolf for funding this talk and all of the folk behind the scenes who are helping to put this, uh, this presentation together, uh, in particular Art and the rest of the colleagues um, on the AV team, so thank you. Without further ado, I'm going to share my screen with you. Let's see here. All right, and let's start this. Let's start this slideshow. All right, so this is a, a cover of the book. I'm glad to hear that there was robust conversation, and I hope that those of you who are members of the book club will be able to share your comments and your questions with me at the end of my talk. So let me get into why people seem to be interested in a 19th century, a book about 19th century history and the history of medicine during the antebellum era and asking me lots of questions, inviting me to speak in particular about subjects in, in the medical fields and in medical humanities that resonates for them today. So I kind of start off with something that's pretty heavy, but trust me, if you follow me, I promise you it will make sense. So medical racism, right? And as I said, I, I talk about the, the 19th century. I do some excursions into the 18th century, but largely the 1800s. And so I like to start with someone many of you have probably heard of, Dr. Samuel Cartwright. And people have a lot of information about him, some accurate, some not so ac accurate, but Cartwright becomes really important because he's such an exceptional figure in terms of his prominence in in amplifying and really promoting um, what we would think of as this kind of not just race-based medicine, but really racist um, ideas in, in medicine and science. So Cartwright um, rose to fame during the antebellum era, during the, uh, excuse me, the 1800s. I'm interested in Cartwright though for two different reasons. So the first, he publishes an article about the distinctions of the Negro. And it hits, it makes a splash because he finds that the distinctiveness of the Negro is rooted in a number of conditions that only they have. So for instance, he talks about um, drapetomania, which is a mental illness, right? And, and what it means, it kind of has two meanings. So if an enslaved person, and, and he also wrote this article based on people who, who were enslaved. If an enslaved person harbored the thought of running away or either ran away, it was a symptom of a mental condition or mental illness called drapetomania. I mean, he had others where he talked about uh, enslaved people who ate dirt, you know, kind of dirt eaters, all of these kinds of things. Right, and some folks said, ah, oh, this is just kind of, you know, a bit of hyperbole. Others agreed with it. The interesting thing though, Samuel Cartwright didn't write this because he had nothing better to do with his time and was thinking, maybe I should uh, do some race-based medicine, uh, you know, and, 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 <laughs> and create knowledge around this. He was actually asked to write the article by the Louisiana State Medical Association. And this was during a time when there was a lot of debate on whether slavery was fit for the Negro race or freedom. And so Samuel Cartwright takes a lot of the ideas, right, that people had about the Negro race and he conducts research and he comes up with these findings based on a state medical association extending the invitation for him to do this. 
What else is important about Cartwright, at least from my vantage point? Cartwright is not the creator of this barometer. And if you look to, I'm gonna use my hands here, to my right, right? So to my right, you'll see a cover of a book and it has two images of the spirometer. This is a, actually a great book, Breathing Race into the Mach Machine by Brown University uh, medical anthropologist, Lundy Braun. But Cartwright uses the spirometer, once again in race-based medical research, to assess the lung capacity of enslaved people. And what he finds at the end of his research is that in fact, the Negro has a diminished lung capacity. His study is so important that near the end of the Civil War, and he conducts his studies, uh, his study in the late 1850s, but by 1864, the United States Sanitary Commission, and this is not on the Confederate side, this is the Union, right, the federal government, they extend this study and they use all kinds of medical instruments and tools to assess the ability, the physical health of black people and white people. And so Cartwright's legacy, right, is extended to the US government. And to this day, we still have this race-based medicine that's being used. And it's, uh, you know, and it, it wasn't even new back then. Um, Cartwright was using some of the ideas that Thomas Jefferson wrote and Benjamin Rush considered the father of American psychiatry. Some people consider him the father of American medicine, but what he's doing, right? He's, he is widening the scope in terms of the medical research between the races. Some of the ideas, black people don't experience pain or black people have thicker skin. Um, black people are biologically distinctive from white people. Lest we think these are ideas that were buried by at least the early 20th century, right? During the, the, during the era of Jim Crow. And then we kind of know better. I wish I could say that was true, but it resonates even in the 21st century because I would often get questions at the end of the talk. Well, you're talking about these people. They lived during the age of slavery. Surely we are past this. And then I bring up 21st century studies. Right. You, I, in fact, I start with one and then I'll end with another at the end of this talk. So Kelly Hoffman was then a, stu a doctoral student in psychology at the University of Virginia. And I get to pick on the University of Virginia because that's where I did my postdoc, lest anyone would think I'm being biased. Right. And I can tell you and some of you who are graduates of UVA, you know, I'm telling the truth. When you are a UVA student, faculty member, like, let me tell you, they are very proud, right? We are Mr. Jefferson's college. This is, you know, this, this wonderful school. In fact, we are the real Ivy League school. So it's a really elite competitive institution. And in order to get into medical school at UVA, you have to compete against the nation's, but really the world's best. So here Kelly Hoffman decides to conduct uh, research, assessing the attitudes of medical residents at UVA's med school and some of the faculty. So here she's talking, uh, she's uh, researching um, these attitudes around pain perception between black and white people. Now, I always remind people, these are medical residents and faculty members. So either they're about to receive MDs or they already have them. These are not people coming out of high school. In fact, in order to get into med school, you have to have at the minimum a bachelor's degree. And once again, these are people competing to enter into a school, to matriculate at a school considered one of the country's best. What does she find in this sample of under, a little under 300, primarily white? She finds that white medical residents and some faculty members believe that black people and white people are actually biologically distinctive from each other. She finds that in fact, overwhelmingly, many of them believe black people have thicker skin. Black people don't experience pain in the same ways that white people do, if at all. Black women don't experience pain during childbirth. Black people have a natural propensity to age more. In fact, two of the students surprisingly believe Black people had tails. So I say, right, 
here you have people who were a part of a study conducted in 2014, the study comes out in 2016, who literally believe some of the same ideas about black and white people that Samuel Cartwright and his peers. And so for me, it helped to explain why folk were so interested in talking about medical racism or the legacy of medical racism, because people are still giving a lot of worth and value to medical, uh, to, to racialized fictions, right? Based on biology and, and all of those kinds of things. As a historian, it's my job to provide context, right? And to be able to have people understand too the, the, the landscape of antebellum America and how the branch of medicine known as gynecology comes to be developed in, in very nuanced and sophisticated ways. So I was initially brought into this conversation, um, not necessarily because I was, I was writing a book and it was gonna be published in 2017, right? At the time I was an assistant professor at Queens College, a part of the CUNY system. And like most assistant professors, I wanted to get tenure, right? I wanted at least someone besides, you know, a few people in my family to read my book, but something happens. Right, And if you all were living and working in New York and you know, towards the, the end of 2017, remember there was this huge controversy around James Marion Sims' statue being uh, located at Central, in Central Park. The thing is, there had already been grassroots organizing around the possible removal of Sims' statue as early as 2008. Uh, 2008. But it reaches a kind of fevered pitch because of Generation Z, right? <laughs> and things go viral over the internet. So August 2017, these four uh, women who were members of the Black Youth Project 100 stage a protest. And they dress in hospital gowns, right, with, with kind of smeared blood to represent the lives of the enslaved women James Marion Sims, known as the father of American gynecology, operated on experimented on in the 1840s. The picture goes viral, as you can imagine. And so the original organizing work that grassroots organizations like Marina Ortiz's uh, East Harlem Preservation Society really becomes amplified. Well, my editor says, oh my gosh, we have to ride this wave. We're gonna release your book early. That never happens. So the original release date for my book, which was November, 2017, happens actually in September, 2017. And all of a sudden, I'm no longer an assistant professor who you know, writes about slaves and the history of medicine. All of a sudden, I'm kind of transformed into the country's foremost expert on James Marion Sims. And everybody wanted to know, should the statue remain or should it be removed? And I thought, I'm a historian and this book is about more than just James Marion Sims. Here's my opportunity to actually do what historians do, which is to provide context, right? And to, to kind of push back against what I thought were, you know, were these really simplistic framings around this situation. So I didn't play nice. And I have to let you know too, as an undergrad, I was a broadcast journalism major and sometimes journalists just get on my nerves. So I didn't answer the question <laughs> because I thought, what a simplistic question, right? Here's my opportunity to, to teach people. And the reason I didn't like the questions is this kind of, you can see here, these simple binary framings. Was Sims exceptional in his treatment of enslaved women? And it kind of went one or two ways, depending upon which camp you were in. So the defenders were like, Sims should be lauded for his, his developments and his pioneering surgical techniques because he took in these poor enslaved women at cost. And I was like, wait, do y'all actually understand how slavery worked, right? In the 19th century, when you, when you were a physician or, you know, administrator of a hospital, what you did in the slaveholding South, you would go to the owners and sometimes you run ads and you say, hey, if you allow me to take your property, because remember, enslaved people were considered legally chattel property, immovable property. If you allow me to take your property to repair them or fix them, I will do so at cost. That was the contractual agreement. And it was also 
based on this practice of hiring out. Today, we would say leasing, right? So you lease slaves. Har uh, Harriet Tubman was leased as early as six years old. Frederick Douglass was leased. So this was something as common as, you know, us leasing cars or an apartment, right? So no, James Mary Sims is not, you know, opening his heart to house these enslaved women because he has to make them better. He's doing it because it's the nature of slavery, which is an economic labor institution. That's number one. On the other side, you had Sims portrayed as this exceptionally brutal and cruel monster who was intent on mangling the reproductive organs of these enslaved women. Sims was also you know, written up as this kind of drug pusher who intentionally got them addicted to opiates. I mean, I, I was reading all kinds of things. He refused to give them anesthesiology, I mean, anesthesia, and, and anesthesia was, was discovered. And so as a historian, I'm like, wait, none of this is true. So what I needed to, to provide were facts and accuracies about a past that often isn't taught reliably in, in schools and most certainly isn't portrayed reliably and accurately in popular culture. So I was able to, to say, number one, Sims as a slave owning physician would not intentionally mangle the reproductive organs of enslaved women. Why? Because in the colonial period, as early as the 1680s in British North America, Slave owners decided, this is a, I think this is gonna be a pretty lucrative institution, economic labor institution. But these enslaved women keep having children by white men, by free men. So if we change the laws that now says, if an enslaved woman gives birth to a child, she passes on her, her status as a slave to the child. That never happened in, in Britain at all. Children inherited the condition of their fathers. Imagine white fathers like, oh, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Imagine with the five children he had with Sally, if they inherited his status. He's losing wealth as a slave owner. So as early as the 1680s in the British colonies, you start to see these laws based on partout sequitur ventrum. Right, and it's a it was an ancient law that essentially says the the infant is uh, inherits the status of of the mother, right, the condition of the womb, and so all of a sudden British law is turned on its head, and it's the only time in this country until 1865 when slavery ends that you have children inheriting the condition of the mother, right. So that's number one, no slave owner would ever intentionally mangle the reproductive parts of enslaved women. Number two, he leased these women from owners. He didn't own them, he leased them. So you also are not committed to damaging someone else's property when you know the very engine of US slavery is predicated upon the healthy reproductive organs, right? And systems of enslaved women. That's how the institution is pushed forward, especially after the constitution bans the international slave trade in 1807. And the country becomes really um, you know, committed to trying to um, produce a domestic slave trade based on natural increase, right? Essentially, you know, increasing the births of uh, enslaved children. So, so those are the things. The other thing about Sims said that black women didn't experience pain in, you know, during childbirth. I'm like, Sims didn't say that. Everybody believed it. That was the reigning scientific and medical belief about black people, not just black women, that they, black people were kind of the missing links between humans and primates. And that they were, you know, so, uh, they existed in such a state of arrested development that they were like children who would run to danger. Thomas Jefferson writes this in Query 14 in his only book, Notes on the State of Virginia. This had been a part of scientific and medical thinking since the 18th century. Sims did not create that. Sims was pioneering, but not in that way, right? 
also this other, this idea of, well, why didn't he use anesthesia, anesthesia? Um, anesthesiology was not a branch of medicine. Sims started these experiments in a rural outpost of Montgomery, Alabama. Where in the world was he going to get all of this, this anesthesia? So once I kind of got that out the way, I'm like, trust me, we can talk about some biomedical ethical issues, but we don't have to make them up. So what I wanted to do as a historian was to really discuss what's the intellectual genealogy of modern American gynecology. And I start with Georges Cuvier, natural historian and scientist, French born. And I, I talk about the work he does on Sarti Bartman, who is derisively known as the hot and top Venus. Some of you may have heard of her. And then I come across the pond, so to speak. And I talk about these US uh, you know, pioneering uh, surgeons, Ephraim McDowell, known as the father of the ovariotomy, and John Peter Matar. Um, you know, I'll talk about these three men in my presentation, but also Francois Marie Provost. A lot of folk hadn't heard of him. He was known as the father of the C section. And, you know, I think about the legacy of, of what Provost did and how it's as enduring as Sims. Provost was born in Haiti. I mean, excuse me, in France. Um, once he graduates med school in 1799, he moves to Haiti, which was then France's most profitable colony. And he starts experimental work, surgical work on enslaved women, enslaved Haitian women to perfect the C-section. But something is afoot in Haiti. It's the start of the, the Haitian revolution. And Francois-Marie Provost decides to leave smartly. And guess what? He relocates to a former French colony, Louisiana, in a town called Donaldsonville. And he begins experimental surgical work on enslaved women in Louisiana. Donaldsonville is not too far from uh, Baton Rouge. He's noted as the second American to uh, perform C-sections. Now, this is a really interesting fact about the work that he performs in the 1830s. Louisiana, from slavery to freedom, and I'm talking about the 19th century to the 20th century, had, it was the state that had the highest number of C-sections performed on Black women. If you look at the stats now, it's in the top three in the 21st century. And yet, people wanted to act like Sims was somehow the exceptional group. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. Sims was in fact a part of a cohort of men who had done this kind of work and produced this kind of knowledge, perfected these surgical techniques decades before he even enters into med school, right? And so a part of this for me is really dismantling these exceptionality narratives. If we're talking about medical racism as a part of a structure or something that's systemic, then you can't have one historical boogeyman, right? If he's implicated, you gotta implicate them all. So for me, it's, let's talk about this systemically and structurally. All right, so now I'm taking off the, you know, that's not even real, real theoretical stuff, but I just wanted to kind of get that out of the way. Now we can go into the things that brought me into history. I like the stories because the stories are compelling. So this is Sarti Bartman. As I said, she was derisively known as the hot and top Venus when she um, is transported from South Africa, her, her birthplace to Europe. Sarti Bartman was sold by her owner when she was 17 um, in South Africa. She was a member of the Khoi Khoi ethnic group. She was a domestic slave. Um, and Sarti Bartman is sold to her owner's brother and the owner's brother's partner, who was an Englishman. Now this, as many of you know, South Africa was colonized by two European nations. Um, so by the Dutch and by the English. So there had been inaccurate information written about Bartman early on that said, well, Bartman was in search of fame and she wanted to become rich. And so she decided to leave South Africa and travel to, to England, to London. Okay, so I'm like, hmm. There, there are a couple of things wrong with this story. I used to live in South Africa for a few months in 2000. 
South Africa borders the Indian Ocean. How would she know as an enslaved woman that there was an Atlantic Ocean? I mean, was she taking geography classes? Most, most people who were enslaved didn't. Number one, uh, number two, she spoke Dutch and her native Khoi Khoi tongue. How in the world would she choose to go to England where she doesn't even understand the language? Number three, she was about to get married. So there's sometimes labels that are put on people like me and they're like, these revisionist historians. I'm like, you're supposed to revise things that are wrong or inaccurate, right? So if that's the worst I can be called, I'm like, I'll take it. So Bartman is sold from South Africa, right? Travels on the Indian Ocean, ends up in London, which is on the Atlantic Ocean. And she's essentially treated like a circus freak, an oddity, all because of the size of her buttocks. And this is where the history of medicine part becomes really important for me. Most people talk about the kind of, you know, cultural um, depictions of Bartman in the press and these kinds of illustrations. But there were some things that happened medically. She didn't just have a big butt, right? It was pathologized. All of a sudden, the size of her buttocks were called steatopegia, right? Which still exists as a condition, an enlargement of the buttocks. I'm like, I live in South Africa. A lot of South African women have big butts, just like a lot of African-American women. I don't have steopatopesia, right? But all of a sudden it's seen as something that is abnormal, that's pathological. And then when she sold to, a, you know, from, from England to a French animal keeper, she eventually ends up in a menagerie in the National Museum of Paris. And that's how Cuvier interests the picture, right? And a menagerie is where plants and animals are kept. Once again, remember this idea of the Negro being the missing link between primates and human beings. And Cuvier is interested, just as these people in this illustration, why does she look this way? Why is her skin this color? Why, you know, wh why are her buttocks so enlarged? Um, does she have the hot and tot hood or, or an elongated labia? And so I chose this illustration because you can see how Bartman enters into this gaze, right? She becomes the other. And to my left, you see someone reaching, right? This, this military um, uh, officer kind of reaching for her buttocks. You see a woman dressed in finery peering at her knees. There was this idea that Africans were naturally not mean. You see someone else bending to try to look under the covering that hides her genitalia. You see someone to my far right, literally with a monocle, like, I mean, tightening the gaze to look at her body. And Bartman is, she can never escape the gaze. So even under Cuvier's observation, he's constantly trying to, to experiment on her. Well, unfortunately, he, he gets the opportunity when she dies at the age of 25. And Bartman is able to perform an autopsy. And what he does, he removes her skeleton. And guess what he finds? She's, she's normal. He examines her genitalia, no elongated labia, nothing, normal. Takes out her brain, maybe there's something to, normal. And then he preserves her genitalia, puts it in a bell jar, preserves her brain, puts it in, in a bell jar, and they display it in the National Museum of Paris. She dies in the early 19th century. It's displayed until the late 20th century, 1974, until it's lost. Her skeletal remains were not sent back to South Africa until the 21st century. But what this told me as a historian who's really interested in the afterlife of slavery, right? And how black women's bodies were treated, examined, written about. I thought, oh my gosh, there's even value in an owned body after it expires, that her, her organs, her brain could be used as teaching tools. I mean, this kind of brings me to you know, this is in the news now, Princeton University and University of Pennsylvania um, in a forensic science class, the professor had students using the, the bones and the remains of um, African-American children who died in an explosion in Philadelphia in 1985. MOVE was this, um, you know, this kind of radical um, black liberationist group, kind of naturalist, they were vegans, all of those things. And anyway, the children um, died in the explosion and their bones were being used in a classroom. I mean, it's all over the news now. 
Well, once again, I'm like, oh yeah, that's like the 18th century. That's like the 19th century, right? This is really the starting point where people begin to talk about and, and, and transport those bodies and display those bodies in pedagogical ways, right? So in museums or in hospitals, um, in teaching colleges, right? Just as it's happening in Princeton and the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard and, and all of those places. So if we move across the pond, right? Ephraim McDowell, father of the Variotomy, and he was a slave owning physician, like all of the men that I'll talk about. Um, and he does his work in Kentucky, right? He essentially performs this um, ovariotomy on a white woman, a Mary Todd Crawford in 1809. In fact, on Christmas morning. And he removes this 21 plus pound ovarian tumor from her body. She actually lives, she was in her late thirties, early forties. She lives until she's in her seventies. But Ephra McDowell in you know, this little teeny town in Kentucky decides, oh my gosh, if I can do this abdominal-based surgery, in fact, considered the first successful abdominal-based surgery in the entire Western world, right? What if I can perfect the technique? And so what he does, he gathers cases and he performs experimental surgeries on women suffering from ovarian tumors. And he does so uh, for about eight years. So from 1809 to about 1817, he takes meticulous notes, but this is the thing. All of the experimental patients are negresses, right? They're black women. Four, uh, four out of the five of these negresses were enslaved. One was a free woman of color as she, as she would have been called in. And he writes about, you know, after he performs the experiments, one, you know, as well, one woman dies, after he performs the experiments and, and these women are, are cured or fixed, he publishes an article and one would think, uh-oh, this, this little fledgling country called the United States founded in the 1780s, right? Or created in the in 1780s as a new nation. Surely this, put, this will put the United States on the, on the global medical map, it doesn't. In fact, he is derided and he is critiqued globally. A British surgeon, in the Lancet, as we know, it's still in publication today, says, well, of course, McDowell's patients would survive, right? Negresses bear cutting with the impunity of dogs and rats. I like to point to this because, A, this is a British surgeon who critiques this frontier backwoods, you know, physician or surgeon as he calls him, but he's critiquing him largely because this idea that Negro women don't experience pain. And in fact, he compares them to two animals that reproduce pretty quickly. So when people talk about these, these, this idea that Sim somehow created this, I'm like, no, he didn't. Like, no, he didn't. This, these ideas were already in circulation, right? So this is 1817. Now, if we move to the 1830s, um, you know, the 1830s, and we talk about John Peter Matar. He's an institution builder, another pioneering surgeon. In fact, he, he founds the Randolph-Macon Medical School. I mean, it's no longer in existence, right? But he's, you know, born to an elite family, much like uh, Ephraim McDowell, slave-owning physician. And he is confronted with two uh, female patients who are suffering from vesicle vaginal fistula. I kind of feel silly telling doctors, right? <laughs> like explaining what it is. You all know what obstetrical fistula is, so I'm not going to explain. Um, so he is confronted with, with this condition. And as you might imagine, for an enslaved woman, this is really bad. And the reason it's really bad, there's a price tag on, on her head. I mean, remember, enslaved people are considered legally, not human beings, movable property, chattel. So if we know that slavery because the international slave trade has ended in 1807, if we know that slavery is propagated by the birth of enslaved children, it really is incumbent upon slave masters to ensure that these women have healthy births, right? That they don't suffer um, unduly during pregnancy. So John Peter Matar decides to do a kind of race-based experimental um, you know, 
clinical trial. And essentially he performs um, surgical technique. He uses silk sutures on the white enslaved patient suffering from obstetrical fistula and the enslaved black patient. And he tells them after he performs, you know, this, this uh, tech, the surgical technique, he says, okay, so you, you must rest, not engage in sexual intercourse. And the white woman rests. She doesn't engage in sexual intercourse. And guess what? She is in his words, she's fixed, she's cured. He's perfected it, except there's a pesky problem. The enslaved woman isn't cured. And he says, for eight clinical trials. He attempts to repair her fistula. He tries all kinds of, of techniques, right, with suturing, and it just doesn't work. And so he publishes an article years later, and he says, had the patient stopped engaging in sexual intercourse, she could have been healed. Okay. This is where I, I say the racial cognitive dissonance comes into play. Sir, you are a Virginia slave owner. You were born into a slaveholding society in the 18th century. You know good and well that enslaved people don't own their bodies. You know good and well that enslaved women just can't say, no, you know what? I, I don't think I'm gonna have sex tonight, especially if they're forced. And I mean, the DNA kind of shows most African-Americans have white ancestry. I, there are not really too many Black people in colonial spaces, right, who don't have European ancestry. So how in the world is this enslaved woman going to tell him or tell any man, I don't want to engage in sex? What if she's being raped? What, you know, what if she's married to an enslaved man? And that's the way she, she wants to express her intimacy. Further, she couldn't stop you from experimenting on her for a number of years because she is enslaved. She doesn't have the right to say, I don't want to do this. And today we call these the social determinants of health. She's going to have a ne negative medical outcome because slavery is a negative social determinant. Guess what enslaved people do, whether they're sick or, or, sick or healthy, they work. It's an economic labor system. You know, so that's kind of what they do. If I could go back to, remember Samuel Cartwright and he writes about the diminished lung capacity of enslaved people. He never once said they live in poorly ventilated, poorly insulated slave shacks or cabins. They live with chimneys in their spaces, right? And they're essentially breathing in this bad air. They have poor diets. He doesn't mention any of that. He's aware of it. And maybe he just doesn't care or it doesn't, you know, just kind of doesn't make a difference. But these are the social determinants that slavery creates, right? That causes the medical, the negative medical outcomes. Now, James Marion Sims was aware of Peter, uh, John Peter Matara's surgeries because they published <laughs> about vesicovaginal fistula in the same journal. So James Marion Sims conducts his experiments almost 10 years later. Unlike Matower and McDowell, he was actually born to a family that was kind of middling. Um, and he decides that he wants to become a, a medical doctor. He starts off in South Carolina where he, where he was born and doesn't really like the school and goes to the more prestigious Jefferson Medical College in, in Philly. And once he graduates, goes to South Carolina, he builds up his, his practice, and unfortunately, two Negro infants die. And the community is just like, eh, people are dying. I don't know if we want to go to this doctor. So he moves out west, Alabama, and he sets up shop. And his life changes when a white patient comes into his, his office. And she suffered a bad fall from, from a horse. And James Marion Sims, as any 19th century doctor dealing with a white lady patient, he asks, you know, am I able to, to observe, to peer, right? And she says, yes, she was in such pain. And he writes in his memoir, he says, she was embarrassed, but I was able to see as no man had seen before 
uh, he basically performs a, a vaginal examination. And as we know, in the 19th century, you know, wasn't considered proper for male physicians to touch women and perform vaginal examinations. But he does so, and he he says, you know, he during the the vaginal examination, he opens her up, and there's a rush of wind that's so strong that it turns her uterus right side up. A sound like flatulence occurs, and he has this idea because she's now cured, right? What if I'm able to perform these, these vaginal examinations to see what the real cause is with vesicle vaginal fistula? How does this connect? There's an enslaved woman who is in his, his home, in his medical practice, suffering from vesicle vaginal fistula. Her owner sends her to Sims. And Sims says to her, I can't help you. I don't, I don't work with women. Right. And so he says, you can, because this is in a rural, a rural area. So you can spend the night, but you're going to have to go back to, to, you know, your slave farm. But when this white woman patient comes in, it literally changes his life and that of the enslaved woman. And so Sim says he performs a vaginal examination using two pewter spoons. Right. And sometimes I would tell that and people are like, oh! and I was like, no, no, no. Even in Roman and Greek archaeological sites, you know, Roman and, and, and Greek physicians would have spoons, right? So this is, this is pretty normal. But he performs this and he says, I saw as no man had seen before. It was as close to me as my, the nose on my face. And he writes, I canvassed the county. I gathered up at least half dozen, a little more than half a dozen cases. And Sim says he has a little hospital built for himself. And it becomes the space where he works on these women's problems. Now, this is where I also really love wearing the title of a revisionist historian, because as we know, in New York, the New York State, a New York Women's State Hospital was always considered the first hospital for uh, women's problems, right? And I was like, wait, but Sims actually writes, like he, he writes a whole memoir. He has a bunch of notes. There's photographic evidence. He had a hospital built for himself for the repair of women and women's conditions in the 1840s in Alabama. How in the world do we forget that? I'll talk about that later, right? But I'm, I'm like, no, no, no. So the first page of my book, I mean, page one, First sentence, I'm like the first hospital for women was on a little slave farm. And lest you don't believe me, I have citations, right? Because I'm like, how in the world? But that helped to explain why I encountered so much resistance when I was doing my research because people couldn't understand why I was writing about slavery and gynecology. They just couldn't see the connection because there was a literal erasure of slavery from this branch, from the development of this branch of medicine. So this is a picture of the little hospital Sims had built for himself, right? In Mount Meigs, Alabama. He later, fi later finishes in Montgomery. Um, this is an 1895 photo, as we know, 1844, you're not gonna find photographic evidence. But 1895, he had sold the hospital to a former surgical assistant who had uh, assisted him with these experimental surgeries. If you look, it's, it's grainy, but you'll see in the center, right above the bush, uh, um, an older black man to my right in the lower corner, a little child kind of in a, a like a little nightshirt. And then above the child at the, you know, kind of the upper um, right, you'll see a, a female figure bent over. It looks like a, a, a washing um, basin or tub, right? So it was still a Negro hospital, uh, even in 1895. Sims also, remember those two pewter spoons? Sims's access to these eight or nine enslaved women, we only know the names of three of them, Anarka, Betsy, Lucy, and folk are always highlighting them. And I'm like, there were others. There, there were other enslaved women. They were not the only ones. And what they experienced is just as important as Anarka, Betsy, and Lucy, right? But what he, he gets, um, what he gets, um, thanks, Nicole. What he gets um, developed is the SIM speculum that allows greater access to cervical examinations. By 1849, the experiments are over after nearly five years. By 1852, he writes on vesicle vaginal fistula and his life changes. 
and he is able to get funding and investors and he moves to New York and founds the first hospital for women, right, in Manhattan. But in the articles to come, and there are a few articles that come, right, commemorating this, this feat, you start to see the erasure of Blackness happening. So Sims, the, the narrative talks about these servitors, these slaves, these Negroes, but the images are of a white nurse, right? White um, patients, they're clothed, all of those kinds of things, right? And nobody ever talks about the little mulatto child that was born during the experiments. And I was the only one who found that out because when you're centering a medical history, that actually includes the enslaved folk. I mean, it's kind of important to pay attention to the archival documents that list the enslaved people. And I was like, wait, out of 17 slaves that were leased and owned, only one of them is listed as a mulatto and that's the youngest person on the slave farm. And she was born during the experimental trials. That's what I was telling folk. I was like, no, no, no. If y'all wanna really offer up some critiques, that would be an issue even in the 19th century, right? And so where does that leave us, right? I offer this without hyperbole. There was a much um, more organized and concerted effort to maintain black women's reproductive health in slavery, not because people were compassionate about black women, but because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. The maternal and morbidity rates, unfortunately, in the 21st century rival those of the 19th century. If you want proof, I've written an article with Charlotte Fett in the American Journal of Public Health. It was vetted, all kinds of evidence to show the numbers are similar. And so here we are, nationally, Black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women. The stats are bad for infant mortality, right? So Black pregnant women and birthing people, it's, it's pretty grim. The US is the most dangerous place in high-earning uh, nations for black women to be pregnant or have, have children or black birthing people. So this brings us to also combating some of the harmful ideas, right? Remember I get, began the talk with some of these fictions about black and white people. Well, many of you know, right? If not all of you know that the very thing that folk had been saying, oh, it's, it's black people, it's race that's the factor in creating this, right? Or, or they're fat black, but fat black women are eating poorly. And I was like, you, you do know the average American woman is a size 14 to 16, which is considered plus size, which is not considered skinny. But the mortality and morbidity rates are not the same. Now, folk are finally listening to the reproductive justice activists, the public health officials, and they're, they're showing that it's in fact racism and not race that's a factor in black maternal mortality. Rachel Hardiman, who is a professor and a researcher at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, unlike Hoffman's uh, study that was pretty small, it was under 300, hers is almost 2 million. This was published in the Washington Post, January 8th, 2021. And what Hardiman found was that in the state of Florida, looking at almost 2 million cases, that over half of Black women and, and birthing people and their children were actually saved when providers looked like them. Over half, right, which is astounding. And so I'll end um, by saying what I'd like for us to do, right, is really pivot the conversation and the discussions so that Black women, Black birthing people are not seen as simply objects, right, of kind of scientific and medical inquiry who we other, but we can turn them into the kind of humanistic subjects, right? Whose lives need to be prioritized and cared for and saved. So I thank you very much. I welcome your questions and your comments. Deirdre, thank you so much. Um, as many of you know, Deirdre was originally scheduled to talk to us in April of 2020, but due to world events, we had to postpone. And I'm thrilled that we could finally hear your amazing presentation. So thank you so much for that today. Um, for everyone in attendance, please remember that you can drop your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to as many as possible in the next few minutes. 
So I see that we have one question already. Um, it's more of a question for me, I think. Excellent talk. They would love to share it with their colleagues. Would we be willing to send the link out from this afterward? Yes, we did record this lecture and we'll be sending it out via the Hebert and Listserv so everyone can watch it again if you would like and please share it with others. Um, Diana Delgado from the Samuel J. Wood Library says, thank you for speaking to us and educating us, Dr. Cooper Owens. I have a question regarding the term you coined, medical superbodies. Does this term only refer to enslaved women being medical superbodies or does the concept of medical superbodies include individuals like Henrietta Lacks whose cervical cancer cells have been used to test the effects of radiation to study the human genome, to learn more about how viruses work and so on. Does the use of her cells fall into your concept of medical superbodies or is it different? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, and I wish, look, I wish I could screenshot this because I'm actually teaching my students about Henry Lacks uh, this week. So um, the term medical superbodies is one that can be used across space and time. Right, I, I use enslaved women because that's my, my area of expertise, right? US slavery, 19th century. But I also apply the term, in my book, I'd look at poor Irish immigrant women. And so, you know, I'm showing the ways that their bodies were seen as, you know, stronger, um, th that they could withstand more. Um, even the ways that they lived their lives seem, seemed other than kind of normal um, white ladies. And so this is a term, I think much like Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality that can be used in multiple ways and in multiple locations. So yes, um, there is something though that's unique about Henrietta Lacks. I mean, her cells were immortal. And so in, in many ways it was exceptional, but the treatment of Henrietta's body, right, that, that there's clinical material that was taken um, and her family didn't give consent because they didn't know, right? And so there's a particular way that certain bodies, whether they're colored bodies, poor bodies, disabled bodies are treated um, that I think really gets at the heart of, of medical super bodies. Thank you for that. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, we have a question from Joshua Shore. Uh, what happened with the statue in New York City of Sims? I think there's another statue of his at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Um, so Sims' statue was removed and it is in storage <laughs> in an undisclosed location. It was supposed to um, be uh, placed at his gravesite in Brooklyn and the residents found, found out and they were incensed. And um, there were threats that the statue would be destroyed. So it is in an undisclosed location in New York, um, probably in one of the five boroughs. Um, there is a, so the, the statue is um, at the state capitol in, in Alabama. There's also one, I'm from South Carolina. So when I was doing research in Columbia, which is South Carolina state capitol, there is also a James Marion Sims statue there as well. So, you know, the one in New York was removed, but there are two others in, um, you know, in, in the two southern states where he had the kind of greatest impact. It's unfortunately everywhere. I have a related question as well from Dr. Joseph Benz. He says, fantastic talk. As a historian, what should we do with the past and things like the Sims statue? How do we preserve the history without celebrating its egregious nature? There are lessons to be learned, but how? Yeah, thank you for that. I think, oh, I, I will say this as a kind of aside. When Sims's statue was removed, it's so funny. I started getting all these phone calls and I thought, oh, people love me. It's my birthday. His statue <laughs> was removed on my birthday in 2018. So I always say that the, I know the ghost of Sims haunts me. Um, I think that's a really great question. You know, I, I gotta be honest. I pay attention to statues. I actually read the historical markers, but I'm, I'm paid to do that. I've chosen to do that as my career. Most people don't pay attention. And history isn't contained in statues. This the Sims's statue wasn't created when he was living. Sims wasn't called the father of American gynecology when he was living. All of this happened after he died, right? And so we learn history, I think, in these really harmful ways and dangerous ways because it creates these exceptionality narratives. And remember, I wanted to, to be able to, to put Sims in conversation with a cohort of folk to be able to say, when we talk about these things that are foundational or structural, it's never just one person, right? 
So what I would have liked, um, you know, I, once again, I kind of, symbols matter, but that's not necessarily my fight. I was much more concerned about the legacy of, of medical racism and in particular the, the black maternal health crisis, um, which I saw as a kind of direct um, descendant of, of this 19th century um, medical work, pioneering work that was done. What I think can happen is we are just honest about the past. This country actually has a much longer relationship with slavery than it does democracy. Democracy only came in the 1780s when the United States was formed after the Revolutionary War ended. Slavery and indentured servitude was introduced in the 1600s. So this has been a slave nation much longer than it has been a free nation. And to be able to talk about the impact of this, this economic labor institution in so many fields actually is, it's correct. And we don't need to hide these kinds of things, right? And so I think if you just teach the history as it needs to be taught, that's, that's what you do. Since the statue could be in a museum, um, but statues don't necessarily tell us about history. They're just representations, right? They're, they're symbols. The actual history is the work that people do when they write, when they teach, um, when there are exhibitions that are done where we learn more than just kind of a few words on a placard. So, you know, I, the thing is, since the statue is now removed in New York, it's still in South Carolina and Alabama, but there are people who are actually interested in his life and now they're reading more, they're finding out more, and that's how history happens, right? Historians like me go outside of classrooms and we actively talk about it with people who are interested in it. So, you know, I've talked to members of Congress, to medical doctors, to artists, to uh, college students. I mean, it, it just, it runs the gamut to book clubs. Um, I'm willing to, to talk about this in a language that's accessible, that's interesting, but also shows the connections of slavery to the development of the United States, you know, in, in all of its manifestations. Thank you. And I know we're past six, but we have so many good questions. I'm gonna cheat a little bit and squeeze a few more in. So I hope that's okay. <laughs> Sure. Um, we have a question from Anaya Ed Etzminger. She said, um, do you have any comments on how medical racism, racism informs Black people's hesitance to get the COVID vaccine? I'm a Black virologist and I sometimes talk with older Black people who are nervous about the vaccine that cite their mistreatment by doctors and distrust of the government's motives. Ooh, that's good. That is so good. <laughs> so let me tell you about, that. I have lots of thoughts. I remember doing an article with this woman in, oh my goodness, in, in the UK. Um, at the beginning of the vaccine, she kept saying, I, I want to talk about Black people's hesitancy. And, and I was like, you do know that Black people can have thoughts and still do something different. Most Black folk have gotten the vaccine if it's been available to them. The majority of Black folk have gotten the vaccine. The people who are out here talking about it, it goes against my constitutional right to wear a mask and to be made to get a vaccine are not Black people. Black people actually, you know, especially older ones, they've always had a distrust of the medical establishment in the medical field. But guess what? They still go to doctor's appointments. Now, they may not have full confidence that you care as much about their health, but they still go, right? And they still get vaccinated when they join the military and when they send their, their children to school. Um, I tend to think that the, the media um, and I say this is someone who has a degree in, in mass communication, broadcast journalism. The media will sometimes over amplify Black people's rightful distrust in ways that makes it much bigger than what it is. Now, that doesn't mean that Black people are not voicing their concerns about you know, what this vaccination means and they're not connecting it to Henrietta Lacks or especially to Skiki now that they know the story of Sims and some of the other folk. They're, they're having these conversations, but many of them are, myself included, right? My, my elderly parents who are in their 70s, um, many of them are going out and getting the vaccines. And I am really interested, I think when the data starts to, to come out, over this past year, you're gonna see that more black people have been much more willing to get the vaccine than what the media is actually letting on. 
Okay, one final question I'm going to squeeze in from Onye Balugan. He said, um, thank you for this riveting talk. Do you see a connection between the women upon whom Dr. Sims operated and recent violence perpetrated upon women like Breonna Taylor, Makia Bryant, and Sandra Bland? Is the perception of the female, the Black female body being able to tolerate more at work here? Yeah, you know, I, I would say with Brianna, unfortunately, because she was sleeping, so there was not even an engagement with her. Um, but there is this, you know, and, and there are all kinds of studies that show this, you know, from sociologists, from political scientists. I mean, it, it just runs the gamut. There are ideas that Black people are just different, not just biologically, but Black people have a different value system, right? The Black women are more masculine and mouthy and all of these kinds of things that um, Black people are often not, especially Black women are not treated as um, respectfully, you know? So when Sandra Bland literally acts like, you know, folk who, who are like, wait, why are you stopping me, right? I mean, how many times have we mouthed off at authority figures but, but white women don't necessarily think that they're going to get shot or taken to jail for a simple traffic stop. Um, Kia, Makia Bryant, bless her. You know, I've seen so many things. Oh, it, it was a justified shot. I'm like, okay, so let's look at the context. She's 16. She was in foster care. Another teenager called the cops because the teenager didn't trust that the adults in the area were being responsible. She was, she literally had bitten, been beaten up by two grown women, 28 and 30 years old. They were fighting a 16 year old. All of you are doctors or in the medical field. You, we know that brains continue to grow until we're in our twenties. So she runs in the house instead of the adult stopping her to say, no, Makia, don't do that. She goes in, gets a knife. They allow her back out of the house because she's so frightened and angry. And then folk are like, well, she deserved to get to get killed. And I'm like, think about the, the young men. And there are lots of them, young white men, right? Who literally shoot up movie theaters and synagogues and churches. And they go to, ra to, 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 to rallies where black people are, are protesting peacefully. And they go with rifles that their mothers provide for them. And the police literally give them water or take them to Burger King because they are still seen as children and humans. Right having a bad day. Right, 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 or having a bad day. And so there is a way that humanity and humanness, actually that's a more important word, I think, that humanness, not just humanity, humanness is an extended to black women. So you could have someone like Matawa say, oh, if this, enslaved, if this slave had just stopped having sex, she could have been healed to not recognize what slavery creates in her life where she can't just stop having sex even suffering from obstetrical fistula? So great question, thank you. So Deirdre, unfortunately, I think we have to end for today, but really pulling from one of your quotes from the book and from your talk today, you've really taught us that the legacy, the legacies of the past still have an impact on us today, including an impact on the medicine we practice today. So thank you so much for this talk. It was a pleasure finally having you. Um, thank you to everyone who attended and please stay tuned for the recording, which we'll be sharing later. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.